Welcome, Irish fans, to this week's edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show. On this week's show, we will visit with the recently retired, legendary Notre Dame men's soccer coach, Bobby Clark. Chat with Rob DeClean, the newly named Executive Vice President of the South Bend Regional Chamber of Commerce. And we will get a great insight into what is involved in taking a football team to a bowl game when we meet the two folks who are coordinating the logistics of the trip, Jason Mickelson and Olivia Mitchell from the Notre Dame football staff. Jack Swarbrick a little under the weather as we tape this show, so I'll again try to fill his shoes. And I'm again pleased to be joined by Notre Dame offensive lineman and the leader of Wapu Nation, Sam Bush. Good to be with you, Sam, and I bet you are quite pumped about this news. It broke earlier this week that Quentin Nelson became just the 29th unanimous first-team All-American in Notre Dame history, and Mike McGlinchey just missed joining him, earning first-team honors from four organizations to earn consensus first-team All-American honors. you got to be pumped. I mean, I, I haven't known football here at Notre Dame without those two guys. I've always been on the same team with them. And to see the kind of work that they put in on a day-to-day basis and how how much they not only want to work to be great, but how much they love this game. And, you know, that that's where it all is spawned from is their love for this game. And for that to pay off is I couldn't be more proud of those two guys. McGlinchey and Nelson are now the 84th and 85th Notre Dame players and the 100th and 101st Irish selections because of repeat honorees to be named consensus All-Americans. That happens to be the most of any school, both deserving. Nelson's achievements, an incredible honor. I mean, how tough is it to be a first-team All-American? Three Notre Dame Heisman Trophy winners, Angelo Bertelli, Paul Horning, and John Hewitt, did not earn unanimous All-American status. I mean, it it just really goes to – it attests to what those guys have done and what they've sacrificed to be where they are. I still think that Quentin Nelson should have won the Outland Trophy. Uh, He's the best college football player in America right now, and I think that he uh, – I'll I'll stop saying that. Well, they're both. Exactly. They're both going to get rewarded next year. Yeah, those two have a great future coming to them, and I I couldn't be more proud of them, and I'm so excited to see what the future holds for them. So you're wrapping up your final academic work. How's that going? Uh, Just finished my last paper today. Final paper of college. I have no more assignments due. I'm going to walk into class and turn it in tomorrow, but I am officially – No exams? I had one on Monday. Good for you. But I'm done. Congratulations. Thank you. And so now you've got – this show and then one more special show next week on recruiting and then it's off to the next step it's on all right well we got some great guests and coming up a legend bobby clark right after this time out of the jack swarbrick show we expect a great one tonight this crowd is electrified strong drive and one he'll be at the line that won't be able to stop the drive Folks, you are in for a real treat. Our first guest is a soccer legend in his home country and here at Notre Dame. On November 28th, Bobby Clark announced his retirement as Notre Dame's head men's soccer coach after 17 very successful years and Notre Dame's first ever men's soccer national championship in 2013. Coach, welcome to the Jack Swarbrick Show. I know Jack wanted to be here. He's a little bit under the weather. But my first hard-hitting question is, for a guy who is as active as anybody I've ever been around, what has retirement been like the first two weeks? Well, it's, it's very simple, uh, Jack. I, I haven't retired really yet. I'm still, I'm still at the office. I've come from the office. And, you know, I, I think there's a few things we've got to take care of before, before I bow out. But it's... Uh, yeah, I, I, we've got to get a, my successor. I've got to be around there and make sure that we get. So how long will we have you still here? I don't know. Jack's, uh, I, I'm under contract till June. So okay. I, I think <laughs> we, we, we will look at it once we see. I, if I'm not useful, I think then I'll. I'll. Well. But the first thing is to make sure we get uh, a, my replacement uh, in here and, and we get things sorted out at that end and, and then I'll, I'll feel comfortable because this program means an awful lot to me and, and uh, 
it'll be hard to tear me away, but I, I know it's time. And uh, yeah, it was the most difficult decision I think I, I, I've ever had to make in the, the 17 years I've been here because I've had a fantastic time. You know, the, the, the people I've met are, you know, this is special. When I came here, that was what, what made my decision to come here from Stanford was the people. And that's still very much the same. It'll be very hard to leave them. Coach, you're talking about kind of finding a replacement. Uh, what role are you taking in helping to pick that out and kind of try to train the next, proverbially, you, I guess? Well, uh, you, you know, I, 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 all, I, all, you know, obviously Jack and Jack will make the decision, you know, and I, 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 I don't try to make any decisions there. But I, I, I would love it if it was one of my my coaching tree, some of the, the, the coaches that have worked with me over the years here and that, who are now head coaches and, and uh, and and uh, I, my, you know, I think I, I can't say any more than that. But I've I, I've given my my opinions whether whether <laughs> MDO listen to me or not. That's uh, you know that's very much. But it'll be it, Jack, it'll be Jack's decision, of course. Anybody who's in sports understands, but the fans don't. Just how in, all encompassing it is. You had a spectacular twenty year career. Uh, as a soccer player, much of it for Aberdeen, and then you've been coaching ever since. And it really is 24-7 with occasional breaks. So at what point did you say, you know what, because you still look healthy as heck. If you've got any <laughs> issues, like we have never been able to see them, that it, it really is time to do some of those things that normal people do, and that's basically spend time with your family. I, I think the first person I, I owe some time to is my wife. Yeah, I mean, we, we met in our first year at college you know when we're both I suppose freshmen and uh, she's I would say she's raised my children I've got two three great kids and I think she's the reason they've turned out pretty good you know so uh, uh, and, and it, next year next September will be my 50th anniversary wow. and if I if it was if I was coaching a soccer game which I've been through most of my anniversaries I've either been playing or coaching uh, I, I think I may be or some time but uh, you know she's she she knows how much coaching means to me and uh, I don't know the, the, the one job offer I've already had is my daughter has asked me if I want to be her assistant she's coaching uh, the Claire McKenna women's team so uh, that that's I've got one job that I can do for and, and and my wife's kind of thinking that's a good idea because there's three grandkids out there so that that's a, an added attraction. This almost sounds like a done deal. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of pressure coming from the two women in my in our, our family. Uh, Jamie's not offered me my he, he's he's a he's the head coach at University of Washington at UW and. Uh, but he's not offered me. I, I I don't know if I'm good enough for him, but I I might I might be an assistant with Jen. So and Tommy, of course, is a pediatrician, but he started grassroots yeah. soccer that you are heavily involved in. For for people that may not be familiar, briefly talk about grassroots soccer because I know it's very important to you. Uh, and I bet they're going to need you to make a few more trips to grassroots soccer-related uh, events. Yeah, I think that's something that, that's, you know, I, I, when you look at all the things that, that, that I can do, and I think the big thing is maybe don't get stuck into one thing. But grassroots soccer it would be in Africa. That, that, that's when I really decided to coach full-time, was um, when I took the year in Africa and coached uh, in Zimbabwe and Bulawayo. And uh, that's when Tommy would be about, I think, 13, maybe 13, 14. I think he'd be 13. And after he finished as an undergraduate at Dartmouth, he went back to uh, to Zimbabwe to teach. And he, he taught and played a little bit. And then, he, but he saw a lot of the kids that he had known when uh, when he was, and people he had known when he was there at 13 had died of HIV. So I think then when he he went back to medical school at, at Dartmouth and uh, and he, he was doing he was doing his residency actually in New Mexico at the time and uh, the the professor said to they had to write something about how you, could you come up with a a project that could help society and he came up that soccer because soccer is very important to Africans they could use that as a, a catalyst to to help educate young youngsters in in Africa and it's grown into a, it's a huge organization. Yeah, I think there's about 400 people working in between. They've got places in South Africa. They've got places in Zimbabwe, places in Zambia. 
so that, that that's something I certainly could get involved in and, and, and maybe uh, maybe I could do some good there as well because so soccer you're around soccer but you're also around people as well you know I don't know why I never did this before but today getting ready for this interview I did a little googling <laughs> of Bobby Clark they still write a lot of feature articles on you back in <laughs> Scotland <laughs> And one thing I should have known, but I didn't, he was an, a, a, a superstar goalie for Aberdeen yeah. in Scotland. He, you once went 1,155 minutes consecutively without allowing a goal. That That's mind-boggling <laughs> to me. I, I had a very good defense. <laughs> <laughs> I did, actually. I had... Uh, the the, the 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 sweeper I, in front of me was a was a lad called Martin Buck and, and he went on to captain Manchester United uh, for quite a lot a number of years but uh, no I had a good team you know goalkeeper you, you know you need a good defense in front of you you've got to organize them you've got to be part of that defense but but you know they always give the goalkeeper the praise with shutouts but at the same time. You need more than a. I, I, I've I've also uh, played very well and lost a few goals. So, uh, you know, I I, I, I was a, it was a very good team of that. I, there were some very good teams of, of that era because uh, even when I you know I finished, you you, you had. Um, I mean, Aberdeen were arguably one of the best teams in Europe when when, when we finished, and especially when we had Sir Alec Ferguson, who went on to be the the. the the manager at Manchester United, the most famed manager really in recent times, and he he, he got a lot of his grounding when he was with Aberdeen. You know, and now NBC is carrying Premier League games uh -huh. in the United States, which has to make you feel good. But for folks that didn't know this, back in 1980, you were the goalie on the Aberdeen team that won the Premier League championship. Wow. Well, we won the Scottish Premier League. No, it's, it's funny. It goes back. It was the Scottish Premier League, but it was good because at that time, uh, you, you know, it was a very good team. And we had Sir Alec Ferguson, who actually went on and was the was the, the, the head coach at Manchester United for 26 years. So um, he, I think he kept, uh, he kept coaching until he was about 71 or 72. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just trying to keep up with him. So I, if I get... Because he was obviously a... Uh, one of my mentors, and uh, yeah, so uh, we, 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 but he he always, he gave me a, a, a little biz, bit of advice. He came here and visited a couple of years ago, and uh, he said, when I we're talking about retiring, he said, you want to retire when you've still got enough energy to do, do some it. other things. He said, you don't want to be sort of just limping out the door. Yeah. And he did it. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. And he said, you know, he's been involved in quite a few other things, but I, I think I'll be involved. My old club, Aberdeen, have actually talked to me about maybe doing something with them. And uh, But I don't want to do it where it's taking, you know, your full time at it. And I, I yeah. think it comes a time when, when, when you, you retire. You want to do some different things. You want to still try and use the, the knowledge and the experience you've got to help some other people and things. But I don't think you want to. I mean, being a coach, it, it's... It's a fabulous job, but it is a, a 24 7 job. You, you're at it all the time. And, and I think, to be honest, I think you, you, you need a, a very uh, patient and understanding wife that, that's going to be there for you, but also uh, be there for your children. And she, you know, I, I must say that Bet's done a phenomenal job in that capacity. You know, Coach, you had this incredibly illustrious clear career as a player that led into a very successful career as a coach. When you made that transition, what were some of the things that you took it from being a player that kind of helped you, guide you toward that success that you found as a head coach? Well, I, I had, had a lot of really good mentors. I would say my first mentor was a lad, Eddie Turnbull, a coach, Eddie Turnbull, and then I finished with Sir Alec Ferguson. Um, and I wasn't sure... Uh, whether I wanted to coach. My last five years as a player with Aberdeen, I, I helped, I was one of the, the coaches with the, the youth program at the club, but I wasn't sure, I wa I'd had several offers if I wanted to go into the professional side of the game in Scotland, uh, but I wasn't sure, because I, I also had trained as a, a teacher, as a phys ed teacher, and, and uh, and I thought, do I want to do that? What do I want to do? And uh, it was my old uh, 
lecturer at college. He was he was the, a FIFA coach. That's FIFA's the world body, mm. and he'd been in Zimbabwe. And somebody asked him. They said we're looking. This club called Highlanders was looking for a coach, and he called me up and said, "Would you?" I was just finishing. He said, "Would you ever consider going to Africa and coaching?" And I thought this was a great idea, just for a year to take my my. I didn't know what to do. Take my wife and uh, the the kids, all, all all three kids. We all went out to, to Zimbabwe and and I just fell in love with. It. I said, "This is what I want." I, I that convinced me that I wanted to do that. Uh, they offered me an extension to come back and and uh, a three year extension to that contract. But I, I I literally got back in Scotland and I got a phone call from somebody in America that said, "Had you ever thought of coaching at the college level?" And I said, no. Yeah. He says, well, Princeton are looking for a coach. And the long and the short of it, they took me over. And I spent three days in New Jersey. Now, they, they didn't give me the job. They gave it to a lad, Bobby Bradley, who has since been the U.S. Yeah. coach. And Bobby was a, a Princeton alumnus. And uh, But they were very good. They came back to me and said, look, we really thought you did well, and you. This it was a very hard decision for us. We, could, you know, we we would help you if you if you if you ever considered looking at another university, and, and I, I did. I had such a good time meeting the, the 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 spending time meeting the players, meeting all the people there. I said, this is really what I would like to do, because it's a it's a good halfway house between uh, coaching and teaching. And uh, anyway, the next job that came up was Dartmouth, and. You know, the, the rest history, as they say, and, and uh, I, I, I must thank Princeton for taking me over and giving me the introduction to, I mean, I remember they were showing me the books, the, the NCAA rules and the Ivy League rules, <laughs> yeah. and I'm saying, well, mm. I, <laughs> I don't know much, this is, this is, because I mean, when you look from an outsider, when you look at NCAA, all the rules, and these, these big, thick books of stuff, and, and you're trying to read them, I say, wow. This doesn't make a lot of, you know, it, it, it does maybe make sense now that you're in it. But at that time, I remember saying, I said, well, I don't know much about these rules. But the one thing I do, I know soccer rules and I know about soccer and uh, I know about people. I think I, I can handle people and I can handle soccer. So as far as the NCAA rules, I hope somebody can keep me right. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, I think we did OK with that as well. You look at the places you've been collegiately, Dartmouth, Stanford, Notre Dame, all places that have a lot in common. Were you really attracted to that level of student in addition to an elite level of athlete? Well, it's funny because I don't think I knew the difference. You know, I came over and, and obviously I met the people, first of all, at Princeton, and I really enjoyed talking to the captains there and the team. I, I thought, these are great young men. And then Dartmouth was was special. And, and then I, I, think you, I think once you get into that, Sort of level of, 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 of student athlete, I think it was then easy to move to the next lot because it was Ted Leyland was was mm -hmm. the athletic yeah. director at Dartmouth, and then of course Ted moved to uh, to Stanford, so it made it very easy to make that transition. Do you find that highly intelligent athletes are easier to coach or harder to coach? Because I do know they have a tendency to ask more questions. Yeah. No, I I think you you you, you the, the, I mean mo, a lot of a lot of my my kids that I have here I think I last year's senior class I think I had five guys that went to med school from that group so I so I, I think they were maybe smarter than me so I, but the one thing no I I think it, it's 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 fun working with with smart kids but I think it doesn't matter you know I, I think. Once the game starts, they're all interested. I don't know whether the smartest kids or the not so smart kids. It depends what you call smart, because everybody's smart in different ways. I remember one of my holiday jobs. I was working delivering beer in Glasgow, and some of the smartest people I met were were there was a couple of lorry truck drivers that I I was the boy. I was carrying the stuff into all the pubs in Glasgow. But I remember uh, Alec Murphy and there was a guy, George Fox. These were the two drivers I often went with. And they were such smart guys, you know. And, and, and it's, it's who's smart and there's different smarts. Maybe they, wouldn't have, they yeah. wouldn't have got the, the, their A-levels, but it was just different smarts. And I think when it comes to sport, that's the great thing about sport. You can take people of all different 
intelligence levels and you get them the sports the key and and they all want to learn they all want to listen yeah. so you don't have to be you know sometimes really smart academic guys can be pretty dumb in the soccer field or, yeah. or, or, or the football <laughs> field or the basketball field so I mean, but 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 you you have got to that's that's the, that's the challenge as a coach. You've got to get them all playing together somehow, and you've got to get them playing as a team. Uh, I think it was one one uh, it was a famous Scottish manager that, that that actually coached Liverpool, who Liverpool were one of the top teams of that era, and he said it's sport. He used to say it with a broad Scottish accent, it's really a form of socialism. <laughs> <laughs> And this is a guy called Bill Shankly, and, and it was, but he says, it's, and I've all got to play together, and, and that's the way he put it put it over. But it's true. That, that's a great thing. I mean, what do you do with, 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 a, with a, and it's, you know, can we get get everybody to play as one and play together? And, and that's the challenge of being a coach. And it doesn't yeah. matter what sport you're doing, whether it's, it's uh, you, you, you know, it's football, it's, it's, it's hockey, it's it's, uh, it's basketball. We're all trying to get the team, the kids to play together and buy into it. And that, that's the fun of it, you know. I think that that's the challenge that I get, that you get a group of guys playing together. And you've got to get, it's not just the guys that are playing. It's how do you get the whole squad, yeah. how do you get the last, the last person in your roster, how do you get them still contributing? And I'll miss that. I'll miss it. Well, you know, Coach, I was just going to say, uh, after 31 seasons, what do you think you're going to miss the most? But uh, I, th I think you just got that one covered. Yeah, people. Yeah. It's, it's all about people, and that, 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 that's, that, that's it. You can, you know, you, look, there's a lot of folk will know the X's nose as well as I'll know the X's nose, but how, how, how do you handle people? And that, that's what I hope, you know, that whoever my successor is, he, you know, he loves it as much as I have, yeah. you know. In addition to, to the people in general, is there a moment from your 17 years at Notre Dame that's going to stand out, or is it going to be just as a, a unit experience? I think it's a unit experience, but I think the one that at the moment stands out is is when we lost our last game. And I, no one else knew, but I knew, I well, Jack knew, and Beth knew, but... I hadn't told anyone else, and I knew I was walking off there for the last time. And I wanted it to, I wanted this to be a. I would loved it to have been a, because it was a good team. We had a good team this year. It could have gone further, and and that was disappointing, for me. And walking off, I was really. I would say I was being numb. I think that's yeah. the only way I could describe it. So nobody else really knew except Beth. Because she said, are you going to tell the team? I said, no, no, not right now. I said, I think I'll wait uh, a few. I'll let Thanksgiving get over and I'll tell them when they come back. So uh, it was, they were numb enough just with losing because we were, I think, I felt we were the better side. But uh, yeah, that's sport. That's why you play the games. You know, I've been interviewing you off and on since you got here. <laughs> And I, I've always enjoyed, you know, the sports interview is, or what do you think of your opponent? Who's playing well for you? I always enjoyed the conversations before and after yeah. we started recording, even better than the interview. But I don't think I've ever told you this. Just your personality, your energy, we park fairly close to each other behind the Joyce Center. Mm -hmm. And I might be down or thinking, and Coach comes on and goes, Jack, how are you? <laughs> and somehow this energy transfer immediately, and you'd get in your car and drive away, I just felt better. I just yeah. had more energy. I mean, have you had that effect? Have you ever sensed that you have that effect on people? Well, it, I hope, well, I, I always, I'm a, I'm a pretty up guy. I think. I've never seen you frown. Uh, and uh, something always, we always catch that the freshmen, when they, they come out, I always say, it's a great day for the race. And the freshmen, it's usually practice, and that they think there's a race, or uh, and they'll say, <laughs> they'll say to something. What, what race is he? What race? And I can say the human race, and and it is. Where did this come from? Uh, Where did this optimism come from? I don't know. I, I it's I don't know. I, I I just love being around sport and around people, and I love going to work every day. That's it's great when when you work. And I think an athletic department is a it's an up place. You know, I mean, I, I'll go into our locker room as, you know, you've got Mike Bray is there and Mike comes in. He's the same. I mean, Mike's yeah. always full of, you know, I love it, you know, and, and all these guys. Big Rod, he's a bit, you know, slow, but, but you've got Mike, who's, you know, they're all, they're all, it, it's fun. And it, it's fun. I go in every morning and then Kevin Corrigan's full of nonsense as well. And, and, and <laughs> I, 
I always, I always oh, say, yeah. one of the great things about nobody's. It's because everybody likes one another. That they always have what I call microaggressions. They, they're never really over nice to you. <laughs> they would be giving you Sam about your beer. They'd be giving you some. Yeah, He's giving me some flack or something. Flack, but it's yeah. fun, and I, that's what you miss, because you can do that in a locker room, and you only do it to people you like. Mm-hmm. You can't do it to somebody you don't like. You you never want to up. up you know you're not, you're not rude. You know, but all the guys, and you'll miss you'll miss that as a daily. A daily thing you do, and so that that's is is fun, and and yeah, and you you got to be. I think that's another thing I learned from Alec Ferguson. You know, if you don't do, if you've lost a game, you've got to be the first in the next morning or the next day, and you've got to be up. You know, you've got to be up. You've got you've got to get them going. You got to move on. And the same if you win a big game, you got to get them back down, and you got to get their feet in the ground. You got to you move. You've got to move on, and that's yeah. that's one of the, the great things I think you, you've got to learn. Sam, you know we've gone 22 minutes. There's three we, other segments. We, we made a mistake. This just should have been the Bobby <laughs> Clark show. But yeah. since you're not leaving just yet, maybe we'll sneak you on again. I mean, it's a pleasure to know you. It's a pleasure to be around you. I'm happy we're going to see you for a little bit uh, longer. And I know you're going to approach this next stage of your life with the same enthusiasm. And you're probably going to have a better time than anybody else around you. Uh, I don't think I couldn't have had a much better time than I've had these past 17 years. So congratulations, I'll miss you. I'll miss you all. Congratulations. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, guys. We'll be back with more in this edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show right after this time. Philly is sold out tonight. The anticipation is building. We're set for the opening tip, and we are underway here in Notre Dame. Well, tip, it goes to Young, her jumper goes. Jackie Young is going to be a star. One word that sums up this Notre Dame team pretty well, and that is dominant. Marina Mabry fires a three. Mabry for the triple. Catherine Westfeld up over to rim and in. That's Catherine Westfeld. Enrique Ogumbawale. Enrique fires up the three. Got it. Outstanding. If you're not here, you're missing it. Our next guest on this week's edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show is Rob DeClean, who is currently the executive director of an affiliate of the South Bend Regional Chamber of Commerce. Visit South Bend Mishawaka, a job he will retain while taking on a new job. January 1st is the executive vice president of the South Bend Regional Chamber of Commerce. Rob is a South Bend native, and we're pleased to be able to welcome you to the Jack Swarbrick Show this week. How different is the new job with the current job that you're somehow going to keep and do the new job as well? So it's just an, I think it's an accurate reflection of where the organization has come over the course of the last seven years. So uh, the, the Visit South Bend Mishawaka is an affiliate. We've grown. Uh, tourism is becoming an increasingly more visible part of the local economy. So we're going to just be integrating our efforts more directly with the efforts of the chamber uh, to advance the, the regional economy. And uh, um, I'm pretty excited about the opportunity. Now, I know the university is a huge economic driver uh, in the South Bend area, as is the athletic department. I don't know. Sam was reading an article in USA <laughs> yeah. Today, and it, I mean, it just kind no, of blew uh, him away. It was an ESPN. Oh, okay. And I, yeah, I saw that uh, on off off weekends when there's no home football game, what the uh, average revenue of the South Bend area is somewhere around a million dollars. And then on Notre Dame home football weekends, it spikes up to $16 million. I mean – is that about right? Are those numbers Does that sound right? about right? Because that's just – It's pretty accurate. We partner with Notre Dame every year on an economic impact study of football specifically. It's just over $15 million per football weekend, sort of what that averages out to be. Mm-hmm. I think what's uh, most impressive about that is $13.5 million of that is spent by visitors from outside of St. Joseph County coming to a Notre Dame football weekend. So what it, is, it's phenomenal. What is that – majority look like is that on hotels or food or it's it's all of the above the hotels certainly reap the benefits yeah. uh, they, they average about between 80 and 95 percent occupancy uh, on any given football weekend but the restaurants absolutely the you know the the attractions the shops uh, certainly the local grocery stores benefit for people buying tailgating supplies and whatnot uh, but it's just um, it's it's one of the the absolute benefits uh, and privilege of being home to one of the elite college football programs in the country. This is a this is a bucket list item for a, a large population in this country and even internationally. You know, we uh, we set up uh, we have a mobile visitor center and we set up outside of uh, Eddy Street Commons every home football game. So we're at the corner of Eddie and Angela, and um, our record was um, I believe it was Southern Cal. We talked to people from 38 states and 11 foreign countries. 
uh, for that particular weekend. So oh, wow. it just goes to show you the, the huge impact and draw of a Notre Dame football weekend. So how many of those folks that come in just for football, maybe for the first time, have you ever been able to delineate how many of them learn about the community, enjoy the experience so much that they come back for a non-football weekend? Well, a good percentage. I mean, that's the thing. So you have the bucket list people that come in for, the, for their once-in-a-lifetime game, uh, but you also have a significant population, whether they're alumni or just fans, that um, it's an annual trek. Uh, and then that itinerary just builds every single year. Certainly the game is the focus, but they do get out into the community and they do experience South Bend. And, um, and that's all part of the Notre Dame football experience. So um, it's, a ni- it's a nice hybrid of, 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 of fans that are here for their first game, but also the absolute tried and true people that come for a game a year or even several games a year. Obviously, football is the big driver economically in terms of money from outside South Bend and the county. But what are some of the other events that go on here in the athletic department in the building where attached to the football stadium, the Joyce Centers across the street? What are some of the other events that bring in people? So these facilities are um, incredibly uh, important to the community. Youth sports in particular um, really drives our market. You know, when you get outside of the football and, and, and the the notoriety it brings as a destination. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. The Compton Family Ice Arena. Um, I know Jack Swarbrick was instrumental in placing that on the, the southern edge of campus, adding a second rink. Uh, you combine that with some facilities that we have in downtown South Bend. We have four sheets of ice. Um, we host um, significant numbers of youth hockey tournaments year in and year out. Just this year already, uh, the Compton Family Ice Arena um, is responsible for over 12,000 hotel room nights. Uh, just in 2017, and we still have two more events left on the calendar. So how does that translate into dollars? It's a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> it millions. Is, We're talking millions. Several million dollars, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It's a, you know, tourism is about a $550 million uh, annual industry for, for St. Joseph County. Uh, sports dominates that, youth sports in particular. Uh, and the, the Compton Family Ice Arena is a, a perfect example of that. And it goes beyond hockey. We hosted the USA Arena Curling National Championships back in the spring. Uh, we've hosted figure skating events. We've got a USA Hockey Youth Tournament coming in the spring of 19. Uh, but then you look at in the summertime, America's Youth on Parade. America's Youth on Parade is the, the world championships of, of baton twirling, believe it or not. And it's proud home uh, in Notre Dame and South Bend for about 47 years. It's our single biggest non-football event of the year. Fills about four to five thousand hotel rooms um, over the course of a, a, a of a solid week, and um, just hugely impactful. About the third week of July every year. So because I dodge those batons and have been dodging them for 37 years what kind of an economic impact are we talking about that one's between about six and seven million dollars oh, every okay. summer yeah so, so it, it's it's huge and it's funny you dodge the batons and all the hotel uh, housekeepers dodge the the glitter and, and then the things that get left in the hotel rooms but it's 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 you know it's just it's a part it's a part of the summer season in, in south Bend. it is um how does, uh, how does Notre Dame's impact on its local community compare to other college towns or other universities and their impacts? Well, it's pretty significant because what you have with Notre Dame is there is just a cachet to, and a reputation to the university. So even something like, you know, we do we benefit greatly from even youth baseball tournaments, for example. So we, we don't necessarily have a great youth baseball facility in St. Joseph County, but they use the high school fields. They, they'll use even four winds field downtown South Bend, but they'll host the championship at X Stadium. And so, and to get that, uh, the ability to, to play your championship game on campus at X Stadium uh, is one of the main reasons that we benefit from just about 7,000 room nights spread over the course of seven different baseball tournaments uh, throughout the summer and early fall. So it's just, um, I think that reputation is, is almost, it's hard to measure because of uh, the, the desire to experience campus and, and just to, to, to be in South Bend and to have the Notre Dame brand associated with your event. Now. For the most part, Notre Dame Stadium has been a football venue. I was here for the 1987 Special Olympics, which I know was a huge economic driver, people coming literally from all over the world. But this building is starting to expand its use. For example, what will the Blackhawks Bruins uh, hockey game that they're going to play here in a couple of years, what kind of impact can that have? I can, you can probably uh, hope that that's going to be near another Notre Dame football game for us. Um, we're going to be, a for the first time in the history of South Bend, we're going to be a New Year's Eve destination. You know, our New Year's Eve hotel occupancy this past year was about 23%. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're fully expecting between 80 and 90% for, for wow, New Year's Eve wow. and New Year's Day. 
uh, for that particular game. And so, uh, and then I know that the hockey team itself is planning on playing a few games um, after the, the NHL Winter Classic. So uh, this, uh, this facility being converted into a multi-use facility and the ability to host events like that um, is, uh, is phenomenal for the community. So the date's perfect because all those people, it's New Year's Eve. They're going to eat. They're going to drink. They're going to spend a lot of money. You got it. I hope the special event planners in South Bend are already planning on hosting some pretty significant parties like we've never hosted in this community before. Because, uh, And then what a great combination of teams. you got the Blackhawks and then the Bruins, you know, the Irish Catholic influence from Boston and whatnot. You really couldn't ask for two better teams to be playing on New Year's Day a year from now. Now, I have no inside information other than I know that at some point there's going to be a major concert in this stadium, and there'll be more after that. So I Fingers don't want crossed. to say anyone's name because then people are going to say they heard it. And So I don't know who it will be, but it will be a top-tier level performer or band or whatnot. What kind of impact can that have? Well, there you go again, another special event. And if you're talking about filling a stadium of you know roughly forty to 50,000 fans, um, you know probably that would be a, a one-night impact, but you're talking several million dollars absolutely easily. Uh, but beyond that, even, and we've already been able to use the stadium for a few convention and meeting events that have filled um, downtown South Bend hotel rooms, but then we've hosted evening functions um, in the new ballrooms on campus and even have had access to the field uh, for, uh, for the attendees to, to toss a ball and take their picture, have the, a welcome message on the new video board. Um, and those types of experiences are priceless. And then those types of experiences that we can offer to other groups um, it, it, it just adds to our entire package of what it means to bring a meeting or an event or a sports event to, to South Bend. You're sitting in one of the rooms that are really part of the Crossroads project, integrating the stadium into the center of all of the activity that's here on campus. Even the multimedia center here is not just athletics, it is faith TV and, and university. So it, everything here is always integrated. What are some of the other events that take place at Notre Dame that may not necessarily be sports related, but uh, bring in huge numbers of people? I'm sure graduation's one of them. Are there some other ones? Exactly. Graduation is absolutely huge. One I always uh, give a shout out to Notre Dame because back in 2010 when they voluntarily moved commencement to the stadium, all of a sudden that made it a citywide event for us because there were unlimited ticket allotments given to, to the students, whereas before when it was in Joyce, I think there were three or four limited to, to each student. So um, that's that's been a, a hugely impactful uh, move for us. Beyond that, though, you look at something like the Stayer Center for Executive Education and what they bring in routinely each month, uh, bringing in executives for, for various professional development opportunities, um, staying in the hotels, eating in the restaurants, and, and, and continually coming back. Um, same thing even with the Executive MBA program. Um, and then an assortment of, of conferences spread throughout the year and whatnot. Um, and then getting back to sports a little bit, too, I, I have to give a shout-out to, you know, a local uh, group, Irish Aquatics. They host four, three events, uh, January, uh, May, and July every year in Rolfs. So um, it's, it's some of the – it's obviously the marquee sports get a lot of the attention, but there's also some of the lesser sports that have a huge impact on, on, on the local community and whatnot. So it's uh, – what Notre Dame brings to the table for us is product and impact is uh, – is truly what separates us from uh, just uh, any other city, really, in the Midwest or certainly in Indiana. Now, Sam, you obviously you're from California. Yeah. Not from here. What have you grown to like about Northern Indiana? Well, <laughs> in addition to Notre Dame. Yeah, I, I was. But you get say, off campus occasionally. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I can I, I can say from my experience, the older I've gotten, the more that I really do enjoy and appreciate the downtown scene that we've had. I remember a couple summers ago. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a band playing at the Morris Performing Arts Center, uh, Tedeschi Trucks Band, and I went and saw them and just had the time of my life. I went by myself, uh, didn't even expect to really have as much fun as I did, um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's grown into a really cool little city, and I think it's going uphill, too. This interview gets posted on uh, watchindundy.com. It's going to be seen all around the world. Uh, these shows air on the radio in Indianapolis and Chicago, so you can invite people in. But also, it airs here on WSBT. For folks that have grown up here, what things should they do if they haven't already done it? What hidden gems do you get the most feedback on about, you know, I've lived here all my life. I had no idea that was here or this was here. So a couple things pop into my mind. Right now, uh, the burgeoning independent restaurant scene is, is phenomenal. We're getting really known as a, as a foodie destination. Um, I can't not mention the Studebaker National Museum. You've got to go experience that museum. It pays such a proud tribute to the, to the history and, and heritage of the Studebaker family and what they meant, not just from an automotive standpoint, but from an industrial standpoint uh, to, to the community. 
then in, on adjoining the Studebaker National Museum is the the Oliver Mansion, uh, the the former uh, home of J.D. Oliver, which was bequeathed to the city and the county, completely intact. It's a 38 room mansion with all of the original family furnishings, right down to the spices in the cupboards. So uh, I also say I think that one of the true secret gems of this community. And one of the things that we benefit from having two distinct communities in South Bend and Mishawaka, but then also being in St. Joseph County, are three phenomenal parks uh, uh, districts. Uh, you know, you've got the city parks in, in, in South Bend and the River Trail and the East Race in downtown South Bend. Great parks along the, the heart of the city of Mishawaka. But the county parks themselves, you know, this time of year for, for tubing or cross-country skiing out at, uh, at St. Pat's, uh, canoeing, eagle watching, hiking, you name it. Uh, we just we have a, a lot of hidden gems uh, but I would certainly I would start with all of those. And for folks who are going to take uh, their friends, family, um, say from Chicago or Indy, to see Notre Dame, you've got to be here a few days because it oh, takes yeah. more than a day just to see Notre Dame. But oh. what else should they add? What would be the one or two things, if you're coming to see Notre Dame before you leave town, you should make sure you see? I would say get to downtown South Bend. I would witness the, the momentum and the, the, the thriving nature of what's taking place and the transformation what's taking place in downtown South Bend. If you're here in the summer, you've got to go whitewater rafting down the East Race. Uh, how many cities across the country can say that we have an urban whitewater rafting uh, course right in the heart of downtown South Bend? It was the first in the, the US, country. The U.S. Olympic team's trained here. That's exactly right. It was the first in the country, and there's still only three in the country. We've got one. Oklahoma City has one, and Charlotte, North Carolina has one. So, um, you know, you got to get to downtown South Bend and experience, um, you know, what really is, I would say, an urban renaissance um, and a really nice complement to what's happening on campus. Rob, always a pleasure. Great to Thank see you. you. Rob's DeClean, so everybody, the Executive Vice President of the South Bend Regional Chamber of Commerce. Coming up next, we'll talk with the two people who are trying to ensure that Sam Bush's trip to the Citrus Bowl is as enjoyable as possible. That's coming up next on the Jack Swerberg. Our next guests are in the middle of a big task this month, coordinating the Notre Dame football team's trip to the Citrus Bowl, where the Irish will meet LSU on January 1st. Jason Mickelson is in his seventh season with the Notre Dame football program and his fourth as coordinator of football operations. Olivia Mitchell is in her first season as the coordinator of football operations and came to Notre Dame after serving as the team operations intern for the college football playoff. Welcome, Olivia and Jason, to the Jack Swarbrick Show. Thank you very much. Yeah. Real easy question that's very wide-ranging. How much work is it to get this team to the bowl game? <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot, but we have all hands on deck, and it takes everybody working together as a team to get it all done. And uh, we got a little under two weeks to do it, so we will get it done and make sure that Sam and the rest of the boys are <laughs> in the best position they can be to win the game. I, I get a taste every few years because of other commitments. I don't travel with football that often, but I usually do a couple times every few years. And, Olivia, you helped me hop on uh, at the Stanford game after I came back from Maui with basketball. And every time I take a look at that itinerary, and the detail that goes into it. Really, each trip begins on Sunday of the previous week for what everybody has to do all the way through where everyone sits, any guests who are traveling, all staffers. How long does it take you to put that thing together? Well, a lot of detail definitely goes into it, but we start maybe the week before um, on Sunday putting it together, and even before that in the planning phase, just making sure everything is correct. Now, when you're on the trip, are you kind of like firefighters? Are you there to make sure nothing goes wrong if something does to fix it maybe before Coach Kelly finds out? Absolutely. That's the goal. Get everything fixed before anybody notices. Exactly. <laughs> How often do, does something go wrong, say, on a typical trip? Mm, never. <laughs> Ooh, these, these, guys, these guys are smart. I, I like the arrogance. That's right. If they don't Jason know, in hot. If they don't know it went wrong, yeah. they, it didn't exactly. go wrong. Exactly. exactly. So our goal is just to put it up before anybody notices. So as long as we can do that, we're in good shape. Now, do you guys get to the level where you do site visits in advance and get to meet the, the folks? Because you can have your act together completely. You can have everything laid out. But then you're almost like coaches. 
if the people you're coaching, which are the people at the venue or the site, don't right. do their jobs, then it still doesn't become successful. Right. Um, yeah, the site visits take place about a year and a half in advance. Um, actually, we'll go to the to the city, check out the a few hotels, decide which one is most suitable for the team, um, and head to the stadium. And that's where really where we start building those relationships with the hotel, with the event managers, um, you know, with the food service people, and begin building those relationships so that we can have a successful trip. Now, you just graduated, Olivia. I did. Back in 2016, you have a mm -hmm. degree in marketing from the University of Notre Dame, mm -hmm. the Mendoza College of Business. How many of these guys did you run into over there? Because I, I'm always <laughs> taken aback by just how many football players are in Mendoza. Not me. No, no, he's, he's <laughs> film, television, and theater. So in the marketing class, um, we definitely had a lot of football players. Um, and it just amazes me, especially being on this side of things, how they balance everything. Now, how'd you get, because right now, it, how similar is what you're doing now to marketing? Um, it's pretty similar, just as far as presentation goes. So you want to make sure everything looks good, everything sounds good, and everything is well-received by whoever the audience is. Because last year, you were uh, an intern with the College Football Playoff National Championship. Yes. Uh, what kinds of things did you handle there? So there, it was definitely more big picture. So you have about a year to plan for four teams coming to the playoffs um, and from our perspective you have about a week to plan to go to um, whichever game we're going to um, but I think everything translates and at my time during my time at the CFP um, it was a lot of schedules a lot of planning a lot of coordinating with hotels and working with the city um, but definitely fun and interesting and it definitely translates. Was there ever any reason that you know say a team had gotten into the college football playoff that you would need to accommodate certain uh, things for them or was that just all kind of set in stone once you guys had planned it in advance? Um, it definitely changes so you plan for whichever teams come and the plan definitely changes um, because teams do things differently some teams go into breakfast all together some wait outside and wait to go all in together so it just changes and depends on the team. Now Jason you graduated in uh, 2011 from Ohio University with a bachelor's degree in sports management. Is this something you train to do in terms of those courses? What direction did that point you at when you get out of school? Um, I would say a majority of my classes were geared more towards sales and marketing. Um, so there's a little bit of translation, but um, you can never get the experience that I've gotten without doing it. Um, so real life experience has been the most important and the most uh, crucial to my development as a professional. You also interned with the Lions. What did you do there? I was a football operations and player development intern. So a lot of similar, um, a lot of similar things dealing with logistics with the team, getting the team where they need to go, and then also I got to handle a little bit of player development. Um, our rookie training program every Monday during the season. We got the rookies together and did something different with them, whether it was um, finances or dress or, um, you know, domestic violence courses, things of that nature. How does your time in the pros kind of relate or compare and even translate over into your time here at Notre Dame and in college? Yeah, I think um, the most the thing that I hold closest to me is the relationships with the players. Um, obviously, it's a little different than with NFL players, but at the, at the same time, they're, still, they're just grown-up versions of, of you guys, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, oh, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the NFL, that was more of a business, and, um, you know, it's a little more, uh, you know, black and white as far as what goes on, and um, the guys on the team, and if they get cut and things like that, they're just out. And so um, that part was, is definitely different, but I enjoy the college atmosphere, being around the kids, um, and getting to, to interact every day and all day. And throughout the whole year of the NFL, the guys are only there during the season. You know, yeah. they go away in the off season, so – being around for spring and summer with the guys is, is really cool, too. Yeah. I give you both permission to be completely discreet. I'll start with Olivia. What's the biggest challenge you're facing right now in terms of getting this team to the Citrus Bowl? Um, there is no challenge. They can't be conquered. I'll start with that. <laughs> but um, I would definitely say um, the itinerary. So making sure all those details are together because the party is definitely bigger. We have families coming, players, everyone. If you lead off every job interview you go to with there's no challenge, you can't be conquered, <laughs> you're going to get hired a lot with that smile. <laughs> What's the biggest challenge you're facing? Here? Um, I would say time and the amount of people that are coming. You know, we found out um, on December 3rd where we were going. We were on a site visit on December 5th. And um, you know, we, the guys go home for Christmas on the 22nd. So really we have about three weeks to prepare for 
a week in Florida, and uh, we're just trying to get to give them the best opportunity to win the game. Even though we're there for a week and we're going to Universal Studios and we're doing other activities, Some fun stuff. Uh, oh yeah, we got to win the game. Well, and you got to have, but also, I mean, Coach Kelly's made it clear to me. I mean, sometimes. Uh, half the athletic department goes with you guys, and he's made it pretty clear that this is more business trip than bowl trip, reward for the players. So exactly. how do you balance that? You, you've got to do something, have a little bit of fun for the players. But exactly. the focus this year in particular is to get that 10th win. Yep, get the 10th yeah. win. That's what it's all about. Yep. So when do you guys get to have fun? Because even at <laughs> Universal Studios, you got to make sure everybody's getting their ride tickets and everybody gets fed, everybody gets back on the buses. I've been I've been hurt. pestering Jason for like a week for a fast pass now at Universal Studios. <laughs> we're working on it. We're now. working on it. We'll have fun at the post game party after a win. Which is the neediest group of players? Which position group? <laughs> Oh, geez, you're putting us on the spot. <laughs> well, you can be, you can be discreet, or you can. I, I, your your brain's saying, "Oh, they're all just terrific. None of them ever cause us any <laughs> exactly. trouble." Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Skill players. Oh yeah, the skill players definitely. The the big guys are easy. You tell them what to do, and they listen. Mm-hmm. Some of the skill players, you know, they, get, they question you a little bit. Why are we doing this, Jason? Why are we doing that? Uh, it's because they like the spotlight. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so when do you guys chill? When you get back? And what what will you do when you get back? Do you do you take a few days off? Do you just go sleep? Yeah, just take a few days a off. Ball. Yeah, <laughs> enjoy the win. Just relax. Okay. You got any final requests? Because we're about out of time. <sighs> I got nothing. All right. Yeah, folks, you're closing out the show this week. We've had yeah. some so many interesting <laughs> guests. We're gonna uh, bypass our perfunctory uh, schedule because there is not that much going on uh, <laughs> other than uh, the football game and some uh, high-profile basketball games. Hockey's off for a few weeks. We do have to say uh, that they now have the longest winning streak. Uh, that they have had uh, love that. since nice. they played Division One, So we're certainly uh, very, hockey. very proud. They have won 13 straight games. So. Keep it going, boys. But uh, we're actually going to produce a show next week on Recruiting Day that will air a little bit later on our affiliates. So that means you're not done yet. No, I got one more. You have one more show. You're not rid of me just yet. <laughs> and hopefully the, the Jackwood Sorry. Capital J will be able to come in yeah, uh, next week <laughs> on early signing day. You guys involved in that too? No, we'll leave that not to the recruiting much, yeah. good, good for you. You're lucky. You're lucky about that. So... We want to thank uh, Jason Mickelson and uh, Olivia Mitchell and all of our guests. Sam, always a pleasure to be with you folks. Thanks uh, for listening. Thanks for watching uh, on the web. And uh, we will be back uh, next week in the coming weeks with another interesting edition and many more interesting editions in the uh, spring semester of the Jack Swarbrick Show. Until then, goodbye, good night, go Irish.